I'm sorry for the interruption. Okay, sorry. Can you say that again, Mario? Okay, if the overlap is bigger, that's going to do a couple of things. First, the effect of that overlap is going to make it so that the antibonding orbital is more destabilized than the bonding orbital is stabilized. And to illustrate that, we could use this diagram here. The amount you go down for the bonding orbital is always going to be less than the amount you go up for the antibonding orbital. And that's just a consequence of the math. However, the other thing I was saying is this number HAB, the resonance integral, which describes the energy of the electron being shared between two nuclei, that number also depends on S and it gets more favorable. It gets more better, more favorable. Yeah. I'm needing to there uh, with increasing s. Okay. Now we'll talk about bonding a little bit later, and it's uh, and and maybe we won't recapitulate all the things you did in PCHEM, but bonding is going to be a balance between the repulsion between the two nuclei, electron electron repulsion. Uh, and uh, the kinetic energy effect of having electrons smoothed out over two atoms, and then the attraction between the electrons and the nuclei. And at some point, as you get closer uh, beyond sort of the equilibrium distance, uh, the repulsion term tends to dominate. So if, these, if the radius between these two atoms were zero, that overlap integral would be one, but that's not a good thing because by the time you get there, you've let uh, electron, I'm sorry, nuclear repulsion uh, become quite of a problem. Yeah, Kim? So the resonance integral, is that talking about electron delocalization? Yes, that's electron delocalization over, I mean, it's officially what that resonance integral is, is we take the Hamiltonian, we apply it to B, and then we multiply it by the con complex conjugate of the A wave function. But what that effectively describes is um, an electron delocalized between the two atoms. Okay, and so the more overlap, the delocalization can be. Right, and, and if you can sort of see this, if we were to try to base on what we've got in this drawing, try to plot in maybe orange what the overall total wave function would be. I mean, I'm murdering it there, but um, especially in this region between the two nuclei, your second derivative has gone way down. And so that means the kinetic energy is lower, and that's a favorable thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's the interesting thing. We started out with the Schrodinger equation. We didn't know what the wave function is. We didn't know what the energy was. We did know what the Hamiltonian was. And now, based on some assumptions, we figured out what the energies are going to be for these wave functions. Two, we, we had an equation with three things we didn't know, but I'm sorry, two things we didn't know and only one thing we did. We've now got the energies. Okay? Yeah. That's right. So, so uh, this phi A and phi B represent our basis set of atomic orbitals. We have good equations for that. So we just mix them together. Um, okay. Now, one thing you might ask is, okay, fine, in the overall molecular orbital, uh, for the bonding orbital, how much of the bonding orbital is on A versus how much is on B? Um, well, if it's hydrogen, it's of course got to be equal. And if we plug our values for energy for the bonding and antibonding orbitals into uh, the equations we derived last time uh, for uh, 
our coefficients, we can do the algebra and determine that in the bonding orbital, let me just correct that, in the bonding orbital, coefficient A has to equal coefficient B. That's sort of a no-brainer. You could have figured that out without doing the math. And then for the antibonding orbital, um, they've got to be the negative of each other. Opposite sign with a node in between. So now we can write an expression for the bonding orbital in terms of our starting basis set. Uh, phi A, which is an atomic orbital on atom A. Phi B, an atomic orbital on atom B. And then we have coefficients here where I've just used CA because the magnitude of CA is always the same as the magnitude of CB. Um, we know their coefficients relative values, but we can be a little bit more specific if we remember that for each molecular orbital, if we integrate it over all space, if we, if we multiply each orbital by its complex conjugate and then integrate over all space, that represents the probability of finding the electron anywhere in the universe, which by definition must equal one, okay? That's like saying existence exists. I mean, <laughs> has to equal one. Um, so if you, if you use that and uh, the expressions for these wave functions, uh, take the square of this wave function, set it equal to one, you can calculate what the... Um, you can calculate what the, the absolute magnitude of the coefficients must be, and you can see they also depend on the size of that overlap integral. Um, and so our process for figuring out what the wave function is going to be is to try to minimize the energy with respect to the coefficients and then normalize the coefficients so that each wave function squared integrated over all space equals one. Um, okay, uh, don't uh, fall under the mistaken assumption that coefficient A has to be one half and coefficient B has to be one half. That's not how it works. It's the square of the wave function that has to be equal to one, okay? Uh, all right, so, um, with that, we come to the important conclusion that your, uh, your text points out, which is uh, if you fill both a bonding and an antibonding orbital based from mixing of two orbitals, if you fill them both, that's a net destabilizing thing. And this was new to me. I used to teach in sophomore organic that the antibonding orbital is just about as destabilized as the bonding orbital. So you populate both, you break a bond, but it's sort of neutral. And now we're learning actually it's worse than neutral to populate both bonding and antibonding orbitals. It's actually bad, okay? So when you mix two orbitals, the lower energy one goes down by a certain amount that depends on uh, a lot of factors and the, and the uh, higher energy uh, combination goes up by a, a larger amount. Yeah? Sorry, when you're referring to this, you were referring to, since the antibody orbital is so much higher in energy, if you populate it, it's just so much worse. Than right. So, so now you're worse off than you were if the mixture had not happened in the first place. Right. Yeah? So that molecule is likely not to be stable. Right. That molecule is likely not to be stable. Now, realize that we're talking about a single mixture of two orbitals. The molecules we're interested in are going to be composed of many atoms. And so we may see a mixture at some point that results in probably overall destabilization with respect to those electrons, but all the other electrons in the molecule will be able to, in general, compensate for that. Um, but if you wondered where does uh, closed shell repulsion come from. That is, why do electrons with filled, why do molecules with filled orbitals tend to not interact with each other very strongly? That's because of this. If they did, uh, you would get overall destabilization. 
And so it's that along with electron electron repulsion and then something else we're going to talk about soon called Pauli repulsion uh, that is behind the fact that you can touch things and not pass through them. Okay. Uh, all right. Question so far? What I want to do next is ask the question, what if we mix two orbitals and we don't make this key assumption that this energy of an, of an electron on atom A is the same as the energy of an electron on atom B, right? What if they're not degenerate? Because of course, in organic chemistry, we're not only interested in hydrogen, hydrogen, and carbon, carbon bonds. Those are interesting, but uh, a lot of the interesting chemistry doesn't actually happen there. So we want to know how incorporating other kinds of atoms, perhaps heteroatoms, is going to change bonding. Um, so what I did here is I attempted to do a little bit of math to convince myself that something the text said was true. In chapter 14 point, I think maybe section four, your text presents an equation where it tells you basically that the closer two orbitals are in energy to each other, the better the stabilization is of the bonding orbital relative to the starting orbitals. And they didn't show how they derived that equation, nor did they describe their assumptions. And so I was kind of wondering where the heck did that come from? And I tried to do some math and it got ugly. Um, so I want to take you through the assumptions I made. I will skip over the algebra, uh, and then I'll show you what the conclusions are. And we'll do some, just basic, we'll do some arithmetic to demonstrate, uh, the point that your book has. So let's suppose we have that secular equation and remember the secular equation is what we get from minimizing the energy by taking the first derivative with respect to uh, coefficient a and then doing the same with respect to coefficient b. And we got something that looked like this. I'm probably butchering it, but I, but I think that's it. And we were able to make this equation simpler by assuming that HB was equal to HA. And now we're going to say that that's not true. Okay, they're different. So we're going to say they're different by a certain amount, which I'm calling delta. Um, so this delta represents how far apart in energy is um, HBB from HAA. All right. So I took the determinant of this matrix here, which is the only way we get non-trivial solutions for these coefficients. Uh, I substituted in this value, HA plus the difference between HA and uh, HAA and HBB, substituted it in, multiplied it out, separated the term. So now I've got energy squared energy and energy to the one and then energy to the zero. So this is just a quadratic formula. So you accept that from math before. Don't worry about doing the substitutions. Um, and I had Mathematica help me out with this because it got exhausting. Uh, but you can see that the stabilization, our bonding orbital, <clears throat> the energy of our bonding orbital, instead of being a simple expression like HAA plus HAB divided by one over S, now is more complicated, but depends on this number delta, okay? Both here and then under the square root. Uh, so we, we can tell just by looking at this equation for the bonding orbital energy and the anti-bonding orbital energy, that the difference between uh, Orbital, in energies of orbital, starting orbitals A and B is going to be important in how much stabilization we get. Now, um, some of you are good at math. Um, most of you, all of you are better at it than I am. I really can't look at that 
equation and say to myself, well, what would it do if I increase delta a little bit? I have a hard time following what that would do to the energy. So what I did is I wrote these equations into Mathematica, and then I said, all right, let's um, just put some pretend values in there. Okay, these are non-physical values, but why not? So I said, let's just for fun say HAA is zero. That's our starting point. That's, we could have said something else. It should be a negative number, but to simplify things, we made it zero. HAB should be a negative number because it's stabilizing due to having the electron with a lower kinetic energy and being attracted to the two nuclei where the individual atomic orbitals overlap. So I said minus six. I don't know why, and, and, and arbitrary units of stuff, you know, whatever. Um, we'll pretend k cals or something like that. S is the overlap integral. It has to be between zero and one. Um, if it's one, the nuclei are on top of each other and the energy is undefined and the atom doesn't can't uh, the atoms repel each other. Uh, if it's zero, then the antibonding and bonding orbitals are evenly spaced around these uh, two energies. So I chose an intermediate value 0.2. So we're just plugging those into the equation here. We're going to keep these constant, and I don't know if that's realistic or not, but our only goal is to see if this delta gets bigger, what does that do to the energy difference? Yeah, Kim. I'm sorry, so um, this E with the one sub subscript is the bonding energy, the energy of the bonding molecular orbital. E2 is the energy of the antibonding molecular orbital. This delta E takes E1 and subtracts uh, HAA. That means how much lower is our bonding orbital than HAA? And then E with the delta E with the prime is how much higher is the antibonding orbital than our HAA. All right, so just pick some values randomly, and then I ran a couple of scenarios. Um, did I paste that twice? How horrific is that? Yes, it is pasted twice. That's just really offensive. All right. So with those assumptions in place, let's try a few different values of delta, okay? If you let delta equal zero, that means the uh, atomic, the wave functions on either atom that you're mixing together are degenerate. They're equal in energy. So this is the simple situation we've had previously. You have the bonding orbital and then the antibonding orbital. And because of the value of S that we've chosen, the bonding orbital is lower in energy by minus five arbitrary energy units, whereas the antibonding orbital is higher than your starting point by seven and a half arbitrary energy units. That's the situation we expect. Now let's gradually ratchet up the energy difference between phi A and phi B, this number delta in orange. Um, and I think the scale here is uh, each square on my graph paper represents one arbitrary energy unit, okay? So now A and B, phi A and phi B are separated by two arbitrary energy units, delta equals two. What does that do to the stabilization of the bonding orbital? It actually goes down by a bit, right? When they were even, the bonding orbital was stabilized by minus five relative to phi A. Now it's only stabilized by minus 4.2 relative to phi A. So what that tells us is if the two orbitals that we're mixing together are closer in energy to each other, you get better stabilization, okay? Um, and that's something that I remember being taught in sophomore organic in the fall of 2000. 2000, I think, was an overall better year than 2020, but um, I can still remember it, and I never knew why that was the case. I just sort of accepted it on faith. But now you see that the math makes it have to be that way. Um, and finally, if we turn, what in the heck kind of weirdness is going on there? Hold on, no. 
sometimes when you copy and paste it does weird things okay um, so now let's ratchet up that delta to six which is the difference between uh, atomic orbital A and atomic orbital B and these are the ones that we're mixing so that's six arbitrary energy units now the bonding molecular orbital is only only goes down in energy by minus 3.2 yeah Yes, we're assuming the overlap integral to be the same. That's probably not. You, you probably can't do that <laughs> uh, effectively. But uh, to a certain degree, at least for uh, bonding between atoms of the same row of the periodic table, it might not be that bad of an assumption. The bond lengths don't change that much as you go from, say, carbon carbon to carbon nitrogen to carbon oxygen to carbon fluorine. All right, so overall, larger energy gap leads to less stabilizing interaction. Um, okay. So you may have heard it, you may have heard people talk about something called poor orbital overlap. Uh, that would refer to the s integral being very small, which would also affect HAB, the integral, the resonance integral. Um, they might also refer to this energy difference between the two orbitals. Um, so the general result here is, Lark, go ahead, Kim. Uh, wouldn't the difference in energy between the orbitals affect the overlap? I don't know. That's a great question, and there isn't an energy term in the overlap integral. It's just phi b times the complex conjugate of phi a integrated over all space. So I don't know. I got nothing. In the case, though, I mean, qualitatively, I'm, I'm starting to think about, well, what if one of the atoms, chlorine or bromine, and the valence orbitals are higher in energy if they are, and but then you've got bond radius issues because one atom's bigger than another. So I don't really have a good simple answer for that. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think all of these parameters are interrelated and it's unrealistic to expect that we can turn a switch and one of them changes, but in terms of qualitative trends, yes, if they're closer in energy, the interaction's gonna be better. All right. Um, oh, and this, oh, okay. So um, you can take the boring math that I did having established these energies and you can go back and calculate the normalized coefficients, which I did for each of these cases. And this illustrates another point, okay? When you mix A and B together and they're at the same energy, the coefficients on each atom in the molecular orbital are the same. And you remember how I told you that these numbers are not 0.5? They're not 0.5 because it's not Ca plus Cb that has to equal 1. It's um, the wave function squared that has to equal 1. So these are the numbers you get with all the assumptions we described above. And in the antibonding orbital, the coefficients are the same. Now, if you start to ratchet delta up, what you see in the most energy separated case is that the bonding orbital is majority on the lower energy atom, whereas the antibonding orbital is majority on the higher energy atom. Okay? Let's say that again. The way the math of the coefficients works out, sorry, I'm walking in front of the screen. The way the math of the coefficients works out, if atom B is higher in energy than atom A, and you mix them two together, the bonding orbital will look like the atomic orbital on atom A with a little bit of the atomic orbital on B mixed in. Okay? Notice that when they were equal, the coefficients, when, when the, they were equal in energy, the coefficients were equal. Now that B is higher in energy than A, 
the lowest energy orbital has to resemble A more than it resembles B. Yeah? I'm remembering like faintly from advanced chemistry that we talked about like transition states of like being closer to the energy level. Uh -huh. You know, I was just thinking that I, I, it's uh, what you're referring to is the Hammond postulate, which we'll talk about this year. But that's basically the two adjacent states on an energy diagram. If they are close in energy, they should be close in geometry. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose it's a it, we're not formulating the principle uh, as much here, but it's it seems reasonable. Uh, that it's following that trend. That is, the bonding orbital is closer in energy to phi A, so it should resemble phi A more. Yeah. And, and even, if, even if that's not the reason, it's a useful mnemonic device. Um, and, and the reason really just falls out of the math of mixing, mixing atomic orbitals together to make molecular orbitals. Okay? So um, when might this apply? Um, Imagine that uh, we're talking about a pi bond and A is oxygen and B is carbon, okay? Uh, for carbonyl compounds, we're used to looking at the molecule and caring about the pi and the lone pairs and the pi star. If we, uh, and if, if this were a carbon ox, oops, drawing on stuff. If this were a carbon oxygen pi bond, uh, uh, psi 1, the bonding molecular orbital would be filled, and that would represent the pi bond, and then psi 2 would represent the pi star. Look where psi 2 mostly is. Is it mostly on carbon or mostly on oxygen? Mostly on carbon. What does that tell you about where a nucleophile might want to attack? Carbon or oxygen? Nucleophile is going to attack the LUMO. Most of the LUMO is on the higher energy atom or, or carbon. Therefore, nucleophiles tend to attack carbonyls at the carbonyl carbon. Yeah? Ah, okay. This is another point which we will come to in chapter one. Why did we assume carbon was higher in energy? Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. And in general, more electronegative orbitals are lower in energy. More electronegative atoms have atomic orbitals that are lower in energy. Yeah, Isabella. So is that what electronegativity means? Is that what electronegativity means? Like. Uh huh. Basically, yes. I mean, it's. Uh, I think there's a couple different definitions of electronegativity. Your book will talk about them. I don't have them memorized. It's like, uh, it's, a, it's a mixture of two things. You've got ionization energy, which is how much energy it takes to kick the last valence electron out to infinity. Um, so the lower in energy it is, the harder that's going to be. And then there's also electron affinity, which is once you've got the ion, how much does it want an electron? Or, or actually it may be, if you have the neutral atom, how much does it want another electron? But, but yes, it comes from lower energy orbitals. Um, and it also has to do with how much charge is in the nucleus. Yeah. Okay, so with that in mind, setting up the fact that... Okay, one more question. Yeah. So the coefficients, is it talking about what the orbital looks like or where it is centralized? Both. The co so what the orbital is going to look like depends on what your starting orbitals are. I haven't drawn them here, but, but we were assuming that they were two p orbitals, right? And so the coefficient will tell you what the orbital looks like depends on what your starting alphabet of orbitals was or were, whatever. Uh, the coefficient tells you how much, okay? Um, so... And you could convert an overall percent based on these coefficients. As I said, they don't add up to one. But uh, more, greater than or less than will be sufficient for our purposes. In the LUMO, the coefficient is greater on the higher energy atom, which in this case would be carbon. So that tells you carbonyl compounds are reactive at the carbonyl carbon. 
because that's where more of the LUMO is. Now I've taught this in, I've taught the idea that, well, more of the LUMO is on the carbonyl carbon because oxygen's more electronegative. And people have struggled with that before because I was basically telling them a result without explaining why. This is the why, okay? Um, we've, we've followed it through based on our understanding of the uh, Schrodinger equation, mixing two orbitals together, normalizing the coefficients, finding the energies. And the result that comes out is if two orbitals are different in energy and you mix them, the lower energy orbital is going to look like your starting orbital with a little bit of that mixed in. Whereas your higher energy orbital is going to look like your higher energy starting orbital with a little bit of the lower energy one mixed in. <sighs> that was confusing. Um, let me say it a different way. Uh, the bonding orbital, molecular orbital, looks like it's more on oxygen than it is on carbon. And that's because oxygen's lower in energy than carbon. Similarly, the antibonding orbital looks like it's more on oxygen. Sorry, the antibonding orbital looks like it's more on carbon instead of oxygen. Uh, and that's because it's closer in energy to carbon. And interestingly, this leads us to the same conclusion that we would have gotten from sort of valence bond theory and resonance structures. You'd of the possible resonance structures for that carbonyl compound. Uh, this, the starting one that's neutral is the most reasonable, but the other reasonable alternative is to have a negative charge on oxygen and a positive charge on, on carbon. And that would tell you that it's reactive at the carbonyl carbon. But now you know why from an MO point of view. We're gonna come back to carbonyl compounds. We haven't talked about what the homo of that molecule would be. It's not the pi bond, it's lone pairs, but it's not as easy, it's not as simple as you think. But that's the general result, okay? So we're gonna use that in the future to predict where the LUMO is, and that'll help us predict where the reactive portion of the molecule is. All right, so questions so far? You okay there? Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. If it's a struggle, I feel your pain. Yoda says real the struggle <laughs> is. So, um, yeah. Um, all right. Now I want to talk about some basic characteristics of wave functions and how we use them to actually calculate molecular orbitals for things that are more complicated than what you're seeing here. Okay? Um, so we're going to start with the statement that Electrons are a kind of fundamental particle called fermions, named after physicist Enrico Fermi. I don't know what it means to be a fermion other than they have half integral spin. And in the case of the electrons, their spin is plus or minus one half. Okay? Um, and one interesting property of fermions is that no observable property, anything you can measure, uh, can change if we simply relabel the electrons. Uh, and this is called the principle of uh, indistinguishable particles. Josh? Yeah. Um, I remember in the book it was like talking around the term anti-symmetric. Is that also tied to fermions? It is. And we'll t and we're and we're gonna talk about so that. Fermions always anti symmetric? Um no, what your book is saying is um if you well can I punt on that for just a minute because we're gonna get there. Okay. So electrons obviously don't know, don't have names. We can't tell Bob or Steve from Kevin or Diana or any of the other minions. Um, it's just, they, they just are. And uh, in order for that to be true, you have to, 
this thing about anti-symmetry is going to follow. Go ahead, Dakota. Is spin transferable in any way, kind of like two rotating objects can transfer their angular momentum? Is spin transferable from could, one thing to another? Could two one-half spin electrons become three-half, three-halves and minus one-half? Could two half spin electrons become three? I don't think so, but I have. For, for electrons, I think the only quantum numbers allowed for spin are plus one half and minus one half. If one is positive and one negative, though, can they trade spins? I don't know. Sounds good. I, I, haven't take, I haven't taken the PCAM that would tell me whether that was possible. But I've checked out a book, and I am reading it, so I'll get back to you if I learn something interesting. Um, okay. So that sounds good. No observable property can change if we simply rename or renumber the electrons. Remember that all observables about electrons, all physical properties, are related to the wave function times its complex conjugate. In a, uh, and in that case, any changes in sign are going to go away. Um, OK. So what uh, comes next is something that's derived from relativistic quantum field theory, which I really don't understand. And so we'll have to accept it as a postulate. Um, but this is called the Pauli principle. And you may have been surprised to learn that it's not, at least as stated this way, it doesn't say anything about two electrons in the same spatial distribution can't have the same spin. That will be a consequence of what I'm going to show you, but um, that's not the most basic formulation of the Pauli principle. OK, so we're going to just accept this as a postulate that's true for fermions. And I don't want to get it wrong, so I will write it out here. Um, the total wave function. for a molecule. Now, what do we mean by that? It turns out that we can describe individual wave functions at various energy levels, but you can combine all of those together to have a total wave function for the molecule, uh, which, uh, it, which describes all of the electrons in the molecule. And uh, the Pauli principle says this must be the total wave function must be anti-symmetric with respect to, meaning it's anti-symmetric if you it's anti-symmetric with respect to switcheroo, which is not the word your text uses, but that's trade places. Uh, trade coordinates, trade locations of any two electrons. Okay? <clears throat> so in some ways, we could call this the parent trap principle, uh, which is that um, if you have a twin and you switch places, can your parents tell the difference? Uh, my 9 and 12 year old have really enjoyed watching the Disney Channel original series Live and Maddie, which involves um, one person uh, at playing both parts. She has twins and they often do, their last name is Rooney and they often do a switcher Rooney because they're trading places to see if their parents can tell and it gets a lot, there are a lot of hijinks and other things and um, I don't know why the 12 year old's into it. I think he's attracted to, to Dove Cameron, but whatever. Um, okay, what this means is we're going to call this <coughs> electron the the total wave function for the molecule with electron 1 and 2 in their appropriate places. Then we're going to switch switcheroo. We'll have wave function with 2 and 1 having traded places. And the wave function we get has to be opposite. Okay? So 
the sign of the wave function changes when you switch two electrons. I don't know why, that's, that's the postulate that we're accepting. It has something to do with them being fermions. Um, but you can see that overall, because physical properties depend on wave function squared, despite this change in sign, anything observable is going to be the same even after you've switched the wave function sign. Okay? So this is a constraint on the overall wave functions for the molecule that we have that we can construct. They have to be anti-symmetric with respect to the old switcheroo. Okay. So Yes, so what this represents is the integral of the complex conjugate times the wave function integrated over all space, which we're sort of thinking of as wave function squared. You can evaluate it at different points, you can evaluate it within a certain space, or you can evaluate it over all space. Okay. Um, all right, so let's consider ways in which we might formulate our overall wave function. Um, yeah. Right now, we're going to work under the assumption, we'll say, uh, it's an, uh, let's, let's imagine we have uh, a molecule with only two molecular orbitals in it. So we need two wave functions to describe that spatial distribution. We'll call it wave function one. And, uh, but because we don't want to get mixed up with electron one, we'll call it wave function A and wave function B. And we might say that, we might be tempted to say that the overall, because the wave function is inherently a probability thing, we might be tempted to say that the overall wave function should simply be the product of those two individual wave functions, okay? If we wanted to get a sense for what the electron density for the whole molecule is, which is something we care about in organic chemistry, you would want to look at this overall wave function, which is gonna be related to the individual wave functions for each uh, molecular orbital. Now let's see if this works. This is our test hypothesis for constructing a wave function. And we're going to put a little note on here. We're going to say electron 1 is in wave function A and electron 2 is in wave function B. It doesn't matter that this is 1 or 2. It just matters that we've given them a name, okay? So um, uh, happy face electron and frowny face electron? I don't know. We, can we do one and two? Because then I don't feel silly. Okay. Now, let's ask the question if, uh, and this will be wave function one comma two, if we do the old switcheroo, that would make wave function two comma one equal wave function a times two, uh, wave function A with electron two in it times wave function B with electron one in it. And the question is, are those equal? Uh, or rather, is, are they opposite each other? And the answer is no, they're not. Um, they're neither equal nor opposite. Go ahead. We don't know what or how psi b of one relates to psi b of two. Right. Same thing. So we might be able to satisfy that if we cherry pick the numbers. Sure. Um, we right. I I think we're not sure whether these are the same or not, but at least looking at the equations themselves, there's no reason they have to be equal. 
And in order to keep the Pauli principle, they have to be equal under all circumstances. Um, okay, so we need to construct the wave function a little bit different, okay? And again, this is a hypothesis and we've just gotten to the end of the class. So we'll do try number two, where we attempt to construct the wave function of the molecule in a way that it will obey the Pauli principle. And there's gonna be determinants again. So take a deep breath, read your notes and come back. We are taking about double the amount of time on chapter 14 as I anticipated we would. That's okay, I don't care. So uh, I will see you next time.